In February of 2016, uh, so right after the Iowa caucuses, at the height of the presidential primary for the 2016 election, Forbes magazine published this op-ed espousing what amounted to a pretty exotic and unpopular view at the time. The op-ed was written by a sort of low-profile tax lawyer from a small firm in Southern California who argued in this piece in Forbes that presidential candidate Donald Trump absolutely should not release his tax returns. Never mind the decades of precedent from every president and presidential candidate in the post-Watergate era. Never mind all the other candidates in 2016 releasing their tax returns. Never mind that tradition becoming so firmly entrenched over four decades that it was previously inconceivable that any candidate would get anywhere near the actual nomination, let alone the White House, without releasing his or her taxes. This random tax lawyer in Southern California published this piece in Forbes saying, no, 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 as far as I'm concerned, Donald Trump should not release his taxes. Well, when Donald Trump, in fact, was elected president of the United States months later, he decided, well, when it was time to pick a nominee to become commissioner of the IRS, wasn't there a guy who wrote an op-ed back during the campaign? He looked around this great land of ours full of 320 million capable souls and decided that the best qualified person in the entire country to run the IRS during the Trump administration would be that random guy who wrote that weird op-ed in 2016 saying, of course, Donald Trump shouldn't release his taxes. That's who Trump nominated to run the IRS. He remains the IRS commissioner today. Now, commissioner, of course, that's the number one job in the IRS. The number two job in the IRS is the chief counsel at that agency. This past month, the New York Times reported that President Trump personally intervened with the Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, to ensure that his hand-picked nominee to be IRS chief counsel, his hand-picked nominee to be the number two person in the IRS, should get his nomination pushed through the Senate and quickly and as a matter of priority. The Times reported that the president was so personally focused on getting that particular nominee confirmed that he told Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, that it was, quote, a higher priority than voting on the nomination of William Barr to be Attorney General. Mitch McConnell naturally dutifully obliged. All Republicans in the U.S. Senate dutifully obliged. And so the president's hand-picked IRS commissioner, who had written that op-ed during the campaign saying Trump shouldn't release his taxes, he at the IRS was soon joined by a new number two official, by a new chief counsel, who the president had personally intervened to install in that role. It will not surprise you that it later emerged that that hand-picked nominee to be chief counsel at the IRS, which the president, a person the president personally inserted into that agency, he had previously advised the Trump Organization on tax matters. And he had been partners at a DC law firm with Trump's current tax attorneys. So that was how we set the stage for this moment tonight with Republican senators and Mitch McConnell in particular ushering into the top two jobs at the IRS. These two guys who were plucked basically from obscurity and installed at the top of the tax system in the U.S. while both having very specific ties to the president's particular tax situation. And now breaking late tonight is a bombshell story on the front page of the New York Times that makes as clear as it has ever been why President Trump may have been willing to move heaven and earth to block every conceivable means there might be for regular humans and investigators of all stripes to ever see his taxes. I mean, headline, again, this is just posted tonight at the New York Times, quote, decade in the red, Trump tax figures show over $1 billion in business losses. This is from Russ Butner and Suzanne Craig, investigative reporters at the New York Times, who recently won a Pulitzer Prize for their reporting on the president's financial history and specifically on his tax history. You might remember their previous reporting from a few months ago. That's how we learned that even though Trump had long told this self-aggrandizing tale of how he was a self-made man and the only thing he ever got from his family was a little $1 million loan that he had to pay back to his dad, Last year, this investigation in the Times, in fact, found that Trump had received at least $413 million from his father. And that appeared to be most of the story of Donald Trump's wealth and his purported business success. See, it was all a matter of good planning. He planned his birth perfectly to inherit nearly a half billion dollars from his father. It was excellent acumen, right? The Times also reported last year on numerous schemes that the Trump family, including President Trump himself, appear to have engaged in to evade taxes and defraud their tenants 
in the real estate empire that Trump's dad built in the outer boroughs of New York City. Well, that won them the Pulitzer Prize. Tonight, the Times add tons more information to what's known about the president's financial history and his tax history. Quote, by the time his master of the universe memoir, uh, Trump, the Art of the Deal, hit bookstores in 1987, Donald J. Trump was already in deep financial distress, losing tens of millions of dollars on troubled business deals. Mr. Trump was propelled to the presidency in part by a self-spun narrative of business success and of setbacks triumphantly overcome. He's attributed his, his first run of reversals and bankruptcies to the recession that took hold in 1990. But 10 years of tax information newly obtained by the New York Times paints a different and far bleaker picture of his deal-making abilities and his financial condition. And again, remember, this is the same reporting team that last year put together that detailed financial picture of the business empire and all the financial structures and tax structures that were created by Trump's dad. Well, on Twitter tonight, one of the reporters on this new New York Times piece sort of bottom lines the dad and lad story, the Trump senior, Trump junior dynamic, now that they've got access to all of this new information about Trump the younger. Suzanne Craig bottom lines this on Twitter tonight as this, quote, father and son, we now have tax information on Fred Trump and Donald Trump for a number of years. The upshot, Fred always made a lot of money. Donald always lost a lot of money. In terms of the new information they've got a hold of, Russ, Bu Russ Butner and, and Suzanne Craig have obtained basically 10 years of federal tax information from Trump, from 85 to 1985 to 1994. Now, they don't have his full returns. They say they've got printouts from his IRS tax transcripts, and they've got specific data from his basic federal tax form from his 1040. But from that information, what they're able to piece together is just brutally negative. Quote, the numbers show that in 1985, the first year for which they obtained new tax information from the president, 1985, Trump reported losses of $46.1 million from his core businesses. He then, quote, continued to lose money every year for the next 10 years, totaling $1.17 billion in losses for the decade. Quote, in fact, year after year, Mr. Trump appears to have lost more money than nearly any other individual American taxpayer. Mazel tov. The Times figured this out when they compared his results with detailed information the IRS compiles on an annual sampling of high-income earners. Trump's core business losses in 1990 and 1991, more than a quarter billion dollars each of those years, that was more than double those lo the losses of the nearest taxpayers in the IRS information for those years. And again, this is not super current tax data, right? The latest year for which they've got information is 1994. They've got 1985 to 1994. But that period is formative in terms of his image, right? That period, the mid 80s to the mid 90s, is exactly when Trump built his supposed business financial success story that became the whole basis of his brand, that became the whole basis of his career thereafter. Well, now we know what was really happening over that period. In 1985, he lost $46 million. In 1986, he lost $69 million. 1987, he lost $42 million. 1988, he only lost $30 million. That was a good year. 1989, ooh, bad year, lost $182 million. 1990 and 91 combined, he lost $518 million over those two years. Over the next three years, he lost an additional $287 million. So, where do you get that much money to lose? I mean, however he was able to wring money out of his dad's business, which he ate and killed, however he was able to convince banks and other lenders to give him money to use, over 10 years, he lost $1.17 billion. And, you know, maybe this explains some things, because maybe the president does not want anybody to know that. Maybe the president does not want people to know that over this 10-year period of taxes, at least, that the New York Times has now reviewed, over 10 years, President Trump only paid any income tax at all in two of those 10 years. Eight of the 10 years, he paid nothing. In 1986, 1987, he paid a little bit. But other than that, nothing. Maybe the president does not want people to know about a particularly strange anomaly that appears in his tax returns in 1989. Out of the blue that year, the Times reports tonight that President Trump declared to the IRS that he made $53 million in income that one year from interest. 
over $50 million in interest income. I mean, you know, like you have a checking account or a savings account that pays you a little interest, or you have some other you know, financial instrument that pays you some kind of interest. How big would those accounts or holdings have to be to pay you $53 million just in interest in one year alone? As a standalone thing, in no other year in this entire decade does he report anything remotely close to that much interest income. Where does it all come from in that one year? Um, these financial reporters at the Times tonight take their best guess and they come up empty. Quote, taxpayers can receive interest income from, from a variety of sources, including bond, bank account, bonds, bank accounts, and mortgages. High yield bonds, though less common today, were popular with institutional investors in the 1980s. To make $53 million in interest, for example, Mr. Trump would have had to own nearly $400 million in bonds that year that were generating 14% return for him that year. Hard data on most of Trump's business life is hard to come by, but public findings from New Jersey casino regulators show no evidence that he owned anything capable of generating close to $53 million annually in interest income. But nevertheless, there it is. That's what he told the IRS he got that year. The president's former personal attorney, uh, who also worked at the Trump Organization, Michael Cohen, um, he started a federal prison sentence yesterday on a number of felony charges, including his own tax evasion charges. One of the things Cohen told Congress under oath before he reported to prison was that he had evidence of Trump routinely inflating his assets when trying to get loans from banks or when trying to get favorable policies from insurance companies. That testimony from Michael Cohen led law enforcement officials in New York State to issue subpoenas to President Trump's bankers and insurance agents. Those subpoenas at the state level have not been subject to blocking litigation. Those, th those subpoenas have, have gone forward. His insurance agents and his banks are reportedly cooperating with those subpoenas. They are conveying information to New York state authorities, including New York state financial regulators, in response to those requests. Trump's bankers and his accounting firm have also been subpoenaed for Trump-related financial information. Um, those subpoenas are from congressional committees telling Mazar's accounting firm and, and Deutsche Bank and Capital One Bank to hand over documentation about their financial dealings with Trump. The financial editor at the New York Times has reported recently that the material that Deutsche Bank prepared to hand over in response to those subpoenas included multiple years of Trump's federal tax information. The deadlines for those financial firms and banks to hand over that kind of information to Congress, they have been pushed back temporarily because the president and his adult kids, he's a great father, uh, have sued to stop those companies from handing over those documents and complying with those subpoenas. But for all the fights about executive privilege and the you know, regular tension between the executive and legislative branches and all the other ways this stuff traditionally gets fought out, no serious legal observers seem to think that those lawsuits filed by Trump and his kids trying to block the banks and accounting firms from handing over those materials, nobody seems to think those lawsuits have a prayer in the long run. I mean, you, you can't stop a third party, you can't stop a private entity from complying with a lawfully issued subpoena just because you don't want them to hand your stuff over. But the president's desperation to try to stop any of this financial stuff, any of this tax stuff in particular from being handed over, it's so complete, it's so exhaustive that even those destined to be futile lawsuits, those doomed lawsuits, trying to block those congressional subpoenas to those banks and the accounting firm, those are apparently worth the expense to the president just because they bought him a little more delay, a little more time, even though ultimately they will fail. There is this dam he is trying to build here and shore up here to hold back access to his tax information and his financial information. And it is starting to spring leaks all over the place. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have this headline story tonight in the New York Times. And it is hard to know what's going to happen when that dam finally breaks, given the president's palpable desperation on this issue. I mean, right? He's declared his red line. This is his red line getting crossed. He has installed Trump-connected figures at the top of the IRS. He's got the Treasury Secretary bluntly defying the law on his behalf. We assume Stephen Mnuchin is doing that in part on advice from those Trump-installed figures at the top of the IRS. 
We inquired with the Treasury Department tonight as to whether or not the chief counsel at the IRS was recused from weighing in on this controversy over the president's tax returns potentially being handed over to Congress. We asked if the chief counsel of the IRS, that number two official in the IRS, we asked if he has been recused from that decision-making process because of his prior work advising the Trump Organization on tax matters. We thus far have not heard back from the Treasury Department. We will let you know if we do. But the fact that they tried to install those guys at the IRS in the first place tells you something about the prioritization of these matters for this president. He's doing everything he can, but all of these pathways are either opening up already or they are going to open up. Whether it's the black letter law that says, sorry, Steven Mnuchin, the IRS has to turn over Trump's tax returns to the House Ways and Means Committee. I mean, yeah, they're trying to say no to that, but that is a fight they are not likely to win. Yeah, there's these subpoenas to, to Deutsche Bank and Mazars that they're trying to block with a lawsuit. And again, that, that lawsuit has won them a delay. Ultimately, that is not a fight they are likely to win. And again, the New York Times is reporting that it is a ton of Trump tax information that is included in the material that Deutsche Bank assembled and had ready to hand over and that they presumably will hand over when ultimately they're inevitably compelled to comply with that subpoena. I mean, it's also, you know, it's investigative reporting, right? This Pulitzer Prize winning team had previously laid bare the Trump family finances and what appeared to be their history of rank tax evasion and fraud, right? Laying bare the president's myth of having built his own business empire rather than having taken and inherited and then squandered his dad's, right? All of these paths will open. They'll open you know, in, <laughs> they'll open in Congress, they'll open by virtue of the law, they'll open through open source reporting. Tomorrow, another path is gonna open too. Tomorrow in the New York State Legislature of all places, that body is expected to pass new legislation that'll allow President Trump's state taxes to be conveyed to the Ways and Means Committee in Congress upon receipt of a request from that committee. State tax returns and federal tax returns don't show exactly the same information, but with the pre president both domiciled and having his business entities headquartered in New York, the prospect of New York tax authorities, right, sending truckfuls of Trump tax information up to Capitol Hill upon the passage of this legislation tomorrow. I mean, that just, it means that this story is coming out. The Trump tax information and financial information is coming out. And part of the reason this is fascinating is just in the substance of it. I mean, at the time of his life when the president was marketing himself as being the most successful businessman of his age, we now know his business record at that time was that he was, on average, losing $100 million a year. Honestly, if I had $100 million in cash and a warehouse full of matches, I could not figure out how to burn $100 million over the course of a year, let alone how to do it every year for 10 straight years. But that is the business acumen that he had, which he has nevertheless marketed to Americans as a great success story, up to and including the brand that he ran for president. So on its substance, it's interesting to see this information. But it's also interesting in form because of the president's palpable and sustained and energetic desperate maneuvering to try to stop this stuff from getting out. I mean, yeah, on the one hand, it makes you wonder, what's he so afraid of? We're getting more of a window into that tonight, right, with this reporting from the Times. On the other hand, though, it makes you wonder what he might be capable of when this stuff ultimately does come flooding out. This is clearly what he cares most about. He cares most about stopping this. This is happening anyway. How will he respond to that? And of course, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. There obviously is something special about the president's taxes and his financial statements that cause him to behave in a specific way around this material that isn't really true to this degree for anything else. But at the same time, he is fighting this losing battle to keep his taxes and finances secret, fighting on all of these fronts to try to block his taxes and finances from being exposed. Today, we've also got his administration crossing all kinds of new Rubicons to try to block everything he can related to the Mueller report as well. Uh, and we got more news ahead on that as well. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.